Um, so my name is Natalie Hollier. And I'm Joe McLean. Um, and we work at ThoughtWorks New York. Uh, we're product and experience design consultants. Uh, ThoughtWorks is a custom software consultancy. Uh, and we help our clients with ambitious missions to make great products. For the last year and a half, we've been working with a company called Amplify Access. Amplify Access is an education technology startup in New York City, and they're using lean product development to build a tablet for K-12 education. During today's presentation, we'll spend the first half sharing some of our experiences and some of the things we've learned, and the second half, we'll take your questions and have a discussion. So before we start, uh, what do we mean by lean product design? Lean principles came out of uh, Toyota manufacturing as a way to eliminate waste. Um, and it's an idea that's become uh, really popular in, popular in a lot of areas. Uh, so when we're talking about developing a product, it means moving away from upfront design to continuously changing and evolving the product as it's being developed. Uh, we do this through a process of prototyping, testing, and feedback, um, and take somewhat of a scientific approach. Uh, we come up with a hypothesis of what might provide value to the customer. Then we do user research and testing to validate if it actually does or not. And only if something's valuable do we continue to, to spend time and effort in developing those features. Um, so it's a really flexible approach. It allows you to pivot your product uh, quickly based on learning and arrive at a more valuable product faster. Lean is a really exciting way to build a product, but it definitely comes with its challenges. One of the things that we've seen is that the challenges to lean product development change depending on your team's size and the maturity of your product. When you're starting out, if you have a small team or a relatively undeveloped product, your challenges are largely around finding the right starting point, finding ways to move really quickly and have an efficient process, and make decisions effectively in an environment where there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of unknowns. You may not be totally sure what the endpoint of your product looks like. However, as your team becomes larger uh, and you have more of an investment in your product, there's more pressure to plan, especially if you have a large development team that you have to resist. There's a lot of potential features and a lot of different directions you could branch into, and so you really have to be careful about where you invest. Um, because you have an investment in your existing product, it can also make changing more difficult. It becomes harder to pivot. And also, you have many more decision makers, so making decisions really quickly and efficiently be can become more challenging. In our time at Amplify, we have seen them grow from a very small organization to a much larger organization. And so we've experienced a lot of these challenges firsthand. We'd like to talk about some of the different tools and processes that we used at different points to address these challenges. So Amplify first approached ThoughtWorks with an ambitious mission to change uh, education in schools across America. They had a huge vision for their product, this tablet for education. And we knew that we couldn't build it all at once. It was going to take quite some time. However, Amplify was really committed to building a product that real teachers and real students would use in real classrooms. Uh, so in order to do that, they wanted to get the tablet out early into classrooms and pilot it and get feedback from exactly those people to ensure that it would be successful. So our challenge was uh, we needed to find a starting point and move fast to get the tablets into classrooms early well before commercial launch so we could start see, um, getting feedback and learning and improving. So when we were a small team and we were just getting started, we really had to focus on finding the right starting point. So we looked across all the things that we hoped the product would do, all of the areas where we hoped it would provide value, and tried to identify a solid foundation for moving forward. So we really decided at the beginning to focus on just facilitating the communication between teachers and students. We thought by focusing on this value, we would give ourselves a foundation, both from a product perspective and from a technical perspective, that we could build forward from and expand into the other areas that we hoped our products would provide value. So once we had our starting point, it really became about finding ways to move as quickly and efficiently as possible to provide value. Uh, so a lot of our practices that we enabled were about getting that speed and efficiency. We did a lot of sketch to code and to design dev pairing. So rather than building wireframes, we just sketched things out and in many cases had the designers sitting right next to the developers as we built functionality. This accomplished a few things. First of all, like it helped us resist the, the temptation to plan too much up front and do a lot of design. But it also meant that when we encountered things that were maybe more difficult to develop than we anticipated, we could make changes on the fly and not have developers wasting time trying to implement something that was maybe harder than we realized when we designed it 
to actually implement. A big part of that was really tight collaboration between all the different roles on our team. So this is a picture of a, a developer talking with a QA and a product person and a BA and the designers all working together to try to figure out how we were going to approach building a particular functionality. So this really helped us avoid waiting for decisions to come down the pipe from different groups. We did a lot of this stuff in flow as we went. Finally, we had a design wall. So we took all the things that were going on in the design team, all of our different wireframes, our sketches, and even our visual design, and printed everything out and put it up on the wall. This was really helpful not just for facilitating uh, design critique, but also for just showing the entire team what was going on in the design process. This was really important, especially early on, because things were changing really rapidly. So having that visibility for the entire team was really helpful. And it allowed us to see kind of the entire scope of what we were working on. So all of those things were designed to work together and they really helped us move really quickly. And kind of the net result of all that stuff was being able to get a product out to market in less than six months. So we had a product in schools and we were getting feedback and learning. So Amplify began as this startup with this very small single team that were able to work closely together. Um, but obviously as we grew, we reached a certain point where that was no longer possible. We began to have all these different moving parts which made communication and staying in sync really hard. However, our product was still young. Uh, we still wanted to make a lot of changes. We were getting a lot of feedback, we were pivoting. And so to keep the product consistent and coherent, it became a worthwhile investment in our time to make some of our tools more efficient, to allow us to continue to make changes quickly. So one of the things that we did straight away was change to a flat UI. Instead of having designers uh, slicing assets so we could have rounded corners and shaded backgrounds, we changed our visual design so that it looked similar to this, so that developers could change the, the, uh, the size, the color, the shape, all the UI elements, they could make them directly in the code. Um, flat UI has become really popular recently and this is exactly why. It's not just a fad, it actually makes designing and developing products much faster. The other thing that we did was use style tiles of our flat UI. So instead of creating a visual comp for every single wireframe for a new feature that was being built, instead the designers pulled together these boards which showed all the common UI elements. And developers could refer to the wireframes, refer to this style board, and start working in the code straight from there. Um, it allowed us for a very light touch to have a consistent level of visual design. Another thing that we did was actually make our own custom icon font. Um, so again, moving away from designers creating images, um, which had to be changed every time we wanted to make a change in, in the software, they would instead once off create uh, a scalable vector and then uh, we pulled all those together into a, an icon font, which developers were then able to style those icons, again, the size, the color, the shape, everything, um, in the code, which made it much, much faster to make those changes. We started using a live style guide as well. Um, because things were changing so rapidly and because things were new, uh, if we had a new UI feature that we wanted to build, it may or may not be in the code already. So developers could refer to this live style guide and see has it already has the uh, the visual design already been done? If so, they could reuse that and keep that consistency. And if not, they would add it. And it really just saved us from you know creating that same orange button six times in six different places. Finally, we we pulled that together into a style gem. Um, so creating a library. Uh, where we could use those styles across uh, products. We actually, we started to, instead of having one product, we had two. And we wanted to share that visual design across the products and make it, again, very easy to stay in sync, make changes. So all of these things of making our tools more lean, it was an effort to keep making changes really easy so that we could keep moving at that rapid pace, keep learning uh, and stay lean. As the team grew though, it became very large. It became a team of 50 people, 60 people, and even beyond now. And we were distributed across the United States, across Brazil and India. It became more difficult to make decisions like we showed you before with everyone kind of huddled around a desk and collaborating together. It really became unrealistic when we reached this scale. 
So we needed to rethink the way that our organization was actually structured. So we moved away from having larger uh, product or feature group oriented teams and split up into smaller empowered goal oriented teams. Uh, the teams were still united by a common purpose, the kind of the company vision for education, but they were able to set their own objectives and frame their own hypotheses as to how we could provide value. This allowed them to make decisions independently. We were still unified by our common purpose, but the day-to-day -day decision making at the team level was able to be much more flexible. Also to that end, we took our design group, which as we had grown has started to kind of work as, a, as one coherent group, and we split it up. We took a visual designer and a user experience designer, and we embedded one each in all of these different goal-oriented teams. We still brought everybody together frequently to talk about kind of the decisions we were making across the product and what our interaction patterns were going to be, and also whenever we needed to do visioning for new feature areas. But for the day-to-day -day decision making, the designers were embedded in the teams and were really able to help us get back to kind of that collaborative model of everybody working together that we had had at the beginning of the project. Also, at this point, we really started focusing a lot more on problem definition. So before we would do a design workshop, we would have a problem definition workshop. And so we would go through a process of really trying to understand the problem that we were trying to solve for our users. And then we would use that to kind of frame up and validate all the different solutions we were creating. In a way, this acted as a filter so we could understand which of our concepts were more effectively addressing the problem statement that we had set out to accomplish. Um, all of these things kind of work together to start to build in a lean mindset into our organization, to move us away, away from just thinking about efficient processes, even though that was still important, to really focusing on value and to measuring everything that we did against the value that we anticipated to provide and validating that with metrics. So we've really been on a journey over the past year and a half with this team from doing lean to being lean. It's much easier to start doing lean processes and using lean tools on the ground than it is to change the organizational approach to product strategy. However, as an organization grows and becomes more complex, um, it's an it's ever harder challenge to stay lean and avoid this upfront planning and design. And so we were continuously challenged to evolve our thinking and move this lean thinking um, earlier up in the decision making process to make us more effective at eliminating waste and creating value. Um, it's not to say obviously that we stopped using these processes and tools, but rather we built on top of this. Um, and the way that we did lean evolved as our practices matured. Uh, we moved from trying to build features efficiently to trying to build the right features. Lean product design is a great approach to developing a product, but it won't work unless you kind of absorb some key organizational values. Even if you're an expert in lean and you're really excited or you're really excited about bringing it into your organization, it's not always possible to jump straight into, le into using lean to define your product. You may need to work slowly and incrementally to build trust in this way. It's scary not knowing up front what the end point of your product is necessarily going to be. And you have to have some trust in the process to bring you to a good place. You have to have humility. You have to accept that you're not going to have all the answers right away. It's not about being right or wrong. It's about taking a scientific approach and always be willing to validate or invalidate an idea. And you can't do that if you're too attached to any specific concept or decision. So you have to have humility. Finally, you have to have courage. You have to be willing to start anywhere. You have to not be afraid of making mistakes. You have to be willing to, do, to make a mistake if it's in service of doing the right thing. So we started off by telling you about Amplify's ambitious vision. They were thinking big about a new kind of product to transform the way that we teach and learn in schools. We had to take a step back from that uh, vision and find a way to start small and move fast. And lean product, uh, lean product design was a technique that enabled us to do that with great success. Taking a lean approach to product design uh, is really well suited to situations when you're trying to develop a new kind of product or enter a new market and you have a lot of unknowns. It helps you to learn quickly about all of those things that you couldn't possibly have all the answers for up front. It helps you encounter all of those unexpected external factors that were always going to come into play earlier rather than later. 
And so from this vital feedback, you can make changes uh, early on in the product development. And for a new product or a new market, that can be really key to a success. So we hope you, that this has given you an entry point to using lean product design in your organization in some shape or form, uh, whatever phase of maturity it's at and whether it's big or small. Thanks. We're sure you have a lot of questions, so as you can see, we've left a lot of time. We'd like to use the second half to have kind of an open discussion, I'm, and I open it up to you guys. Uh, do we have the portable mic? I think there is a, is there a mic runner? Oh, you have it. Uh, I guess if you could just give it uh, out to whoever has a question, that'd be great. How did, um, how did the culture and the system that you're trying to build affect the hiring decisions as you're building the team? Do you know anything about how that process went in picking the right people that could rapidly adapt to the, the way you were doing things? Yeah, it, it's a big part of um, ThoughtWorks culture. Um, or ThoughtWorks, the way that we hire people. Uh, we, we spend a lot of time and effort trying to find people with the right cultural fit and who are kind of open to um, working in these ways. Um, so we, we definitely help try to encourage those um, principles and philosophies um, with Amplify as they were hired in as well. Mm -hmm. There's also an aspect of, especially as a design team, I, I think we really tried to focus on people who could think in terms of simple and elegant solutions. That's something we really very specifically targeted when we were looking for people in interaction design especially. Uh, when we were evaluating portfolios, that was definitely something that we had in mind, is their effectiveness of reducing a complicated problem down to a simple solution. When you were changing the culture, uh, what were some of the hurdles? And Sorry? When you were changing the culture, what were some of the hurdles and challenges that you had to overcome to get buy-in with the uh, culture and flow changes? That, yeah, that, that Honestly, was a huge part um, of what we've been doing. You know, probably over the last six months. Um, it does. Is my mic working? Yeah, it does take a long time to uh, to, to gradually get buy-in to change in those kind of things. Um, I'm trying to think what were some of the things that we did. Um, a lot of it was around being clear on um, setting goals um, and having shared vision and goals within the organization um, that weren't changing because people felt like. Uh, It's hard to, to talk about whether a product or a feature is good in isolation of any goal or any um, user value that you're trying to achieve. One of the, uh, the biggest shifts I saw is when we really started focusing on the problem definition workshops. One of our, uh, one of our colleagues, Paul Sullivan, has, uh, has really like spent a lot of time thinking about how to frame up a problem workshop. And actually, like if you're interested in getting more details, I'd be happy to talk to you about it afterwards. Um, we really discovered that when we, were really, uh, when we were really diligent about kind of defining the problem that we expected to solve before we even went into the design process at all, it really changed the entire tone of the conversation. And it became less about a people's opinions and more about how we were going to get more insight into the value area that we were, we were trying to address. I know it sounds like a really simple thing, but even just going through the discipline as a team of starting by framing the problem and writing it out and putting it up on the wall and using that to define and kind of filter through the rest of the design workshop was extremely effective for us in kind of changing the way that the, changing the tone of the conversation around what we were talking about. Yeah, and also just that shift in thinking about um, the product owner not having to always have all the answers, to have that pressure of always being right. Um, that shift in mindset really allowed, you know, the rest of the team to contribute um, and for us to collaboratively try to arrive at the, at the best solution. It also, I think, provided a path for the developers to be a lot more involved. When you're having the conversation on the level of addressing problems, it kind of opens up the floor for people to present different kinds of ideas. Like Natalie said, taking the pressure off the product owner or the design team to be the generators of these experiments. Two questions. Uh, one is that the level of six, and the other one's at level 60. So um, when you're at six, 
what you mentioned scientific approach. You know, in, in lieu of any statistically significant data, uh, what's a sci what kind of scientific approach would you use, right? And then at the level of 60, um, making very quick decisions is very important. And how do you manage that with uh, so many strong-willed and knowledgeable people on the team? Uh, you know, uh, who does the decision making? What process do you use, if any? But at the at the small level. Sorry. <laughs> Here, we'll take that one. There you go. Uh, so your first question was about. <laughs> Jinxed. <laughs> uh, when we were small, how did we uh, validate without? Just turn off your belt thing. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'd say the approach is scientific, but the conclusions are maybe not right because it's about human interaction with software. Everyone's different. Um, one of the things that we tried to do early on was um, build a better understanding of teachers and students. Uh, so we did a lot of user research, going out and talking to them, not um, before we even had a product. Um, so not testing out our product with them, but actually finding out, you know, what are some of their day-to-day -day, um, pain points and challenges and issues that they have? What are the ways that they think about teaching uh, or learning? What gets kids excited by school or the teachers or not? Um, so really trying to gain that, that understanding um, so that we'd be able to better make decisions from that. And again, taking our product into the schools early and observing uh, people using it, you know, observing teachers or, or students struggling with particular things. Um, so that's how we were able to get um, feedback quickly, even when we we're small. Um, so yeah, it wasn't, you know, about 50% of these people in this A-B test. It was very much, let's go and talk to the real people that are using it. Mm -hmm. uh, the second yeah, question. It, yeah, it just from, I, I guess, like a, of nuts and bolts practical approach one of one of the things that kind of guided our research at that phase is we would just talk to people until we started hearing the same things again and again and that that to us i think was the indication that we had talked to enough people a lot of the time we were at that especially at that point in the product development we weren't looking for like statistically significant information we were looking for a lot more qualitative data we didn't really talk about research very much because that's a whole other story and like how that has changed and grown over the organization I think we're, look, we're more data-driven now. It was important at the beginning to more, be more qualitative because as you identified, we didn't have enough people to have like, that kind of statistical insight at that point in the product. Um, oh yeah, decision-making decision when we were big, the second part of the question. Yeah, uh, I'll repeat it, yeah. So I believe the second part of your question was, with a lot of uh, strong-willed people who have well-informed opinions, uh, as the organization gets larger, how do you manage decision-making? Roughly, is that good? Um, I'll let you start. <laughs> um, again, I think uh, one of the, the techniques that really helped us with that was the problem definition statement. Um, and having that focus on, you know, it's, it's not about individuals um, asserting, you know, their opinions and their ideas were better than other people, uh, but it was about you know looking at what was the feedback that we were getting from our researchers at the schools and th from the teachers that we were bringing in and um, seeing how people were using the software and trying to sort of take that approach of you know moving away, detaching your you know individuals and their association and their um, fondness of their own ideas, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. That exact problem, though, was also part of what drove us to break into much smaller teams. Uh, I mean, it, it was really a direct reaction to that issue. We had started to sense that, especially in conversations about like architecture and technical decisions, there were just so many decision makers that it was hard to get conclusive results, which is exactly what you would expect. So having teams have like more specific focuses within the product uh, and, and kind of be able to make decisions a little bit more independently really helped us with that. We definitely needed to make an investment in infrastructure to enable that. Obviously, like there need to be certain systems in place for teams to be able to work independently. Um, so a lot of that like infrastructure and plumbing between groups was important to figure out at that phase, which is again, kind of a, a larger story. Um, but that, that was a big part of why we made that decision at that point in time. And again, I guess the, the goal-oriented teams was also an attempt 
at that, um, moving back to the situation where a team can work really tightly and have you know very fast real-time feedback with each other and be empowered to know that the decisions that they're making or what they're choosing to do uh, are right because they can measure them against these known goals. Uh, whereas if it's building out a product backlog, um, you know, it, it can take a long time for kind of product vision to come down, or the, you know, through the organization. I'm, I'm curious to hear a little bit about the makeup of the small teams that you created. Who, you know, how many engineers, who's a part of the team, what's the balance that you found that works well? Sure. Uh, so. It's a little bit different uh, depending on the, the team. Um, we have some kind of back-end infrastructure teams that as you would expect are a little more engineer focused. But generally speaking, I would say that, like, like for instance, the two teams that I work on are both um, six to seven developers, uh, one to two QAs, uh, a dedicated product owner for the team, uh, and then as I mentioned, a user experience designer and a visual designer. So, um, I guess like we've we've been hovering around a three to one developer to designer ratio uh, for a while, and I think we found that that works pretty well for us. Anybody else? Um, I'd be curious to hear how do you deal with the um, uh, the earlier phase of design being good and trying to uh, account for things uh, that 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 might happen later and obviously with lean you don't want to do that but then as new patterns emerge and new needs emerge on common uh, 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 components how do you manage moving those forward so that you don't have a product that has dissimilar behaviors across what should be common uh, components hmm. <laughs> I miss was the question was around how to keep kind of the, the product coherent or it was around uh, mm -hmm. yeah uh, one of the things that um, yeah we, we noticed early on um, was a, as we were very first beginning to build this product we had no UI patterns right um, so as time went on we we really felt a need to kind of create these patterns and make sure that where we were using something, we were using it elsewhere. Um, initially, what we went with was the things that were kind of faster and easier to develop, right? Because we didn't know if we were going to be throwing out that feature later anyway. Um, so we just wanted to kind of get something there that worked, that was, you know, usable, but maybe not the greatest thing ever, kind of. Um, and so once we kind of got the product to a certain point where we had examples of UI patterns, we were able to see, you know, through observation in the field, um, which ones worked well or not. And ones that worked really well, we then took those and we, we made those UI patterns. And so our, our design wall was a big part of that, was having you know, our designers kind of huddle around the wall and talk about, you know, I noticed that, you that you've that designed this feature, but it's really similar to this and this one here. How about we use the same pattern? Um, so I think th the design wall sort of facilitated that, that cross-team collaboration and consistency. Another thing we did is, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of conversation around tech debt, the idea that over just the natural time of, of building a product, you wind up with a lot of technical tasks that kind of need to be done to have a solid infrastructure that is good for the long term. We found that we were building up UX debt as well, and uh, one of the strategies we employed is having a dedicated uh, designer developer pair every once in a while just to kind of go through the entire platform and make sure that everything was consistent again. And one of the strategies we, we employed is just kind of like, even though we would still write stories for that and, and track the work, we would kind of track that outside of the progress we were measuring in the rest of our teams and consider it, just like you'd consider it to be a, almost like a, te a tech task to pay down that tech debt, we would pay down our UX debt from time to time as well. Yeah, and I, I'll just quickly add on that as well, that that, that actually 
worked much better to, to do it afterwards as a UX debt because when we tried to bring it up front and bring that consistency beforehand, it just cre like suddenly you know slowed down the speed of the team greatly because one thing would change and it would change a hundred other things. Um, so it really was much better that before you know particular launches that we went through and did that quick cleanup. There was a great comment in the keynote about engineers planning for reuse before they plan for use. And I think like the design equivalent of that, I think is planning for consistency before you have even figured out what you need. So we, while you definitely need to do a certain amount of forward planning, it's a lot easier to figure out how consistency should work in retrospect than trying to anticipate. At least that's certainly been our experience. I think we're out of time. I'm afraid you are out of time, but thank you so much, Joe and Natalie.